So, um, but with that, Sean, let me take no more of your time. Uh, everyone, Sean Oram. This is a director of engineering, as you can see. Uh, Ecotope as an organization has been the leaders in the United States in implementing heat pump water heaters, big central ones specifically, but they've done a lot of work on smaller heat pump water heaters. They're, they are the leaders on engineering and they're responsible for a lot of testing, standards developments, um, but they've done what, almost, how many have close to 50 designs now that you've worked on for central heat pump water heaters? Is that right, Sean? But, yeah, that's correct. So, um, you know, I pay attention to that. I travel around and uh, that's just remarkable. Um, so, ta-da, here you go. Someone who can really explain some of the issues of how to design central heat pump water heaters. And I will not get in the way anymore. Take care, I will mute myself. Go to it, Sean. Great, thanks, Sean. Um, again, hello out there, uh, Sean Oram with Ecotope. I'm gonna try to walk through I guess the the science behind central heat pump water heating. All right, so here's a quick um, review of the agenda. Um, we'll talk about some background. We're going to talk about kind of high level heat pump water heating design goals. We're going to look at some field monitoring and get some ideas on different load shapes for different types of multifamily buildings. Uh, we're gonna look at this and talk about the prescriptive heat pump water heating system, the new California um, prescriptive system. Give, it, give a little background on that. Uh, then we'll deep dive into the weeds on some sizing of the primary plant. We'll deep dive into the sizing of the temperature maintenance systems, and then I'll show a few examples, and then we'll leave it open for some questions. Um, just to keep everyone interested, I'm, I, I, I love mushrooms, and so the quiz today is if you can identify all of the mushrooms that I show, you win a prize. Amanita muscaria. So a little background. <laughs> all right, you win. Good job. All right, so just to dive in, um, the energy end use is um, in a multifamily building in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I think this would be similar to um, maybe more of the Northern California climates. Um, Bay Area is a little bit milder than, than Seattle, but uh, we looked at 10 buildings back in 2011 and looked at all the end uses. And this is about what we came up with where the energy is being used under that era of code, which was 2008 Washington State Energy Code, which has since improved. So this is a little bit out of date. The important takeaway here is that domestic hot water and temperature maintenance make up about a quarter to um, you know, 35% of the total end use. So it ends up being the largest end use in a multifamily building. It's a big deal. It's also a big deal with, um, um, because it's mostly been served by, by gas. And so as we start to move away from greenhouse gas emissions, um, this, has been, this is a focus. And we've been focused on this for about 10, 11 years at Ecotope trying to figure out how, how to make this work. And we've learned a lot along the way and we're starting to get that information out with these sessions and others. Um, but key um, to this is that about 15% or two thirds of the load is the actual DHW heating and about one third of the load is the temperature maintenance. And so the temperature maintenance is actually a, um, a I think is a much bigger load than most of the world um, assumes. Uh, a little review on global warming potential, GWP. Um, there's a there's a shift, as I think Sean Armstrong mentioned yesterday, 2023 is looking like the kind of the first bands on the traditional HFCs. And so right now, 134A shown in the middle, pardon me, and 410A are kind of the dominant heat pump refrigerant. Um, there are some newcomers uh, to the market, uh, R32, slightly flammable, but that comes in at a 675, so there's some product there. I think that emulates um, more along the 410A cycle, so that's kind of a replacement for 410A. 410A cycles for heat pump water heating are limited because you can't make very hot of water, but they work great on the lower temps. Uh, it, sort of the opposite. 
Go ahead. So, Sean, I, thanks for pausing here for a second. I, I, there's a number of regulators uh, who are on the call. I can just listen, look around like, all right, yeah. the people should hear your opinion as to whether or not 2023 yeah. is a reasonable cutoff year because the manufacturers mm -hmm. have definitely taken me aside and complained that they need at least three years in order to switch over their systems. And I've been like, well, it's 2018 and you're telling me this. What's the issue? Yeah. Like, we need to know. Who are they going to really hold it to 2023? So, uh, do you think they should? Um, you know, I I think you have to you have to kind of pay attention to the market because we don't want to we don't want to just just switch out right. But you know, we're having similar um, questions up here in Seattle, and I think you know the the I think you know where we're settling there is that we're gonna you know keep keep sort of making this um this known that this phase out's happening but putting dates in and then some some extensions but um you know 2023 i think is is the right message maybe there's a you know it, you have to kind of do an assessment year by year to see if there's actually product available um i know that there is a one gas boiler manufacturer that has you know, taken this seriously, and they are coming to the market with a with a, a heat pump product, um, and they they've been kind of in the circles since 2018, and so I think there's definitely a um, you have to be I guess respective of the fact that it takes you know two three years to get this developed, but I think 2023 you know that that date you know i think that date is is fine because it aligns with the bigger picture goals but you know maybe you do an annual review and you say okay where you know sweep the products and see where we're at and you know how how you know how crazy is this or should we give some more time but um, um if you keep kicking the can down well anyway. this is product sweep point that you're making because like right now today we have a limited we have yeah. one co2 product sanded that's not a great place to stand right. regulatorily. And, and that product isn't right. necessarily rock solid and it's financing sand and has you know, an international company. So it's, so point being, but Colmac yesterday, gossip, right? They said that they were gonna have a CO2 product out in the next year or two. So that's at least two. And I, I would yeah. hear you saying that you got, I mean, over here is giggling at me for gossiping <laughs> or snarking, laughing, I don't know what we were calling it. But anyway, gossip here. So like, let's talk about 2021. If 2020, we kind of have a sense of the landscape, looking at these refrigerants here, if we're trying to get to CO2, which is R17, 717 up at the top there, zero? No, 44. Oh, pardon me, 44, mm -hmm. one, right, CO2. That's <laughs> ammonia, 717, yeah. Ah, that's super dangerous, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, is that it? And, and propane's pretty explosive. <laughs> so. Yeah, propane at 290. Um, no more explosive than the gas barbecue that it sits next to. True. <laughs> With an open flame. Um, yeah, right. And an open pipe. Um, but yes. Um, but I think, yeah, the stuff that we've seen, you know, 744 is CO2, 290 is propane. Um, you know, 717 is more, the ammonia is more of a cooling product. I haven't seen anything in heating. Um, but I think, um, you know what? I think um, another manufacturer, Mitsubishi, is is aiming to be at at market by 2021 summer. All right. Um, and then there's there's another. So yeah, there's there's potentially two to three additionals that are kind of getting this this message. Um, uh huh. Or yeah, I think R32 this, is coming in in P tax, right? Because we don't manufacture it domestically, but it's manufactured in Eurasia. But so we're yeah. package units, right? R32, which is the HVAC oriented. Yeah. Like the Daikin Altherma uh -huh. 3, the next revision is R32. Uh -huh. um, and so, and then there's a, there's a couple other products that are R32 that are coming out. And, um, and so that's, you know, that's kind of a temporary solution. Um, and I think, you know, we haven't done any work with 32. We're, we're looking at trying to do some testing on, on some of the, 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 the new, new round of products. Cause I think they have application in, in smaller buildings and especially, a, a single family cause you can do combined with them, heat and domestic. 
right? Okay. So in 2021, because it, it's, let's pretend it's next year based upon what you know right now. Because we want these people to be able to implement with confidence a 2023 deadline, which you said is a good year. Um, yeah. So next year, in 2021, a year and a half or so from now, how many, how many low global warming potential products do you know of? That not leaving aside the CO2, the water heaters on the HVAC side, R32 users, do you, do you know of ones that are actually being yeah. on the market? Um, I, I think there, I know of two that are pretty serious and have directives to be at market by 2021. Yes. Um, I know, I'm so glad I'm asking you this. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> yeah. Continue. Yeah. No, and I, so I would say that, you know, mid, mid 2021 to, you know, Q3 2021, that I think is, are, are the, are the targets and the goals. Um, there's still a lot of work for those products, you know, both a UL standpoint, both the technology, you know, proving the technology, you know, pilots will help that, um, you know, getting, getting real data, understanding how these work, um, solving, still solving the technical challenges with them. Um, but the, but, you know, that's three years from now. And so, you know, that seems, you know, if the focus is there and on, on this kind of critical path items, then, then, you know, I think it's, it's doable. All right. Well, here's one more piece of gossip and I'll let you keep on going. I, I contacted okay. Innova, Yehuda, the guy over in New York City, about yeah. what would it take for them to replace the refrigerant with R32 and make their, right now they top, they bottom out at 14 degrees Fahrenheit to make it one of the negative yeah. fives or the negative 20s, you know, make it a really cold climate product. And he said it was about right. a half a million for each of those jobs, about a half a million to reconfigure the product, had a lot of impacts on the product line, for instance. And he said it would be right. about a half a million dollars for them to make it a cold climate product because it changes, there's a lot of defrosting issues because it gets so frozen on the, the element outside right. pulling in heat. So that's getting super duper cold compared even to the air. Yeah. <clears throat> so he said, you know, but they, they've solved those problems and other, with other manufacturers. It, it's just a matter of them implementing it into their specific product and taking all the measures that you need to take in, as far as keeping things warm enough in there and defrosting it. And right. So it's a million dollars. Just if anyone's listening carefully with the hundreds of millions of dollars that are being released from like the tech and the build programs and the utilities. It only takes a million dollars to get a manufacturer to solve both problems. Everyone listening? <laughs> it's not that much money. <laughs> okay, you continue. All right, great. That was a good discussion. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we kind of covered that, but I think uh, R290, which is propane as a GWP of three, um, I, I think that's going to be one of the products. Um, to look out for and the 744 the co2 um co2 is a great product for um for doing water heat just because of the range that it can operate in and the and the temperature and it it, it works quite well with load shift having really hot water all right um this is kind of background stuff so i'll review that that there's two types of heat pumps um there's a single pass. This will heat the water up uh, to your working temperature, 140 upwards of 170, upwards of 190 on some of the newer stuff um, in a single pass. There's also multi-pass. Those are like boilers. They do about a 10 or 15 degree pass um, on the water. And so you pipe those a little differently. Uh, you can see kind of how the two are arranged. Um, in a building, there are two separate loads. There's a primary heating load, and that's that's the heating water for use. Um, that's really just the function of making cold water hot. And then there's the temperature maintenance. This is to um, to essentially keep the loop primed and ready if you're far away from your central source. This will keep the water hot. Um, you can see a little diagram to the right. Um, the, the red are the are kind of the primary heating loop and then the temperature maintenance and the, or the hot water circulation grabs all of the stacks and brings it back so that keeps everything primed. Um, so when we talk about central heat pump water heating design goals, um, here's a summary of, of kind of what what 
you know, is, is always at play when we're looking at, at designs and also product. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we want to reduce the total water heat energy by a factor of three, and we can do that now. We've done it on projects. Uh, this, this would be the primary water heating and the temperature maintenance. So it'd be both of them all in um, factor of three reduction. Um, I think in order to deploy this stuff at the pace and, you know, what's, what's kind of out in front of us and the task at hand, we need to have fully integrated controls and we need alarming. Um, you know, our, these heat pump systems, there's still reliability issues. They're a little bit touchy, but um, so we need to, we need to have um, a pretty good handle on that. Um, obviously the low GWP refrigerants, you know, what is low? You know, less than 10 was my stab. Um, I don't know if that's been defined. Um, plug and play. Um, we want this to not just be a custom design. We really, if we're going to get this this uh, this product and this concept out, it really needs to be accessible to plumbers, to to you know building owners, to to designers. So plug and play would be really nice, similar to how kind of gas water heaters are set up now. Um, you know, cost effective, this is a really important point. Um, right now, heat pump water heaters do cost uh, a lot more, um, specifically in California, than, they, than we're seeing in Washington. I think this is just uh, uh, an artifact of having kind of a, an emerging market. You know, the market is not mature in this. And so I think, you know, carrots, i.e. dollars, um, should be on the table to help, to help with some of these uh, inc higher incremental costs. Um, again, the reliability and having redundant systems, you know, strategies around this, we've, we've experimented with a lot of different variations on redundancy, um, but reliability at the end of the day is, is the critical piece. You, got, you, can't, you can't ever run out of hot water. And then having the ability to load shift and the, what the load shift, uh, the load shift really represents kind of the, the crux of why we're doing central heat pump water heating, and that's really to 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 essentially use thermal storage as as a battery and um, this this definitely changes the design when you inter introduce this concept of load shift where you're you're telling the heat pump it can't run in this certain window of time and that changes that ripples all the way back through on all the sizing uh, so this is really important to to as we're starting to put these together that we're also considering the load shift in in this um, Here's a, um, so I, when I think about water heat systems, they're kind of like the movie Groundhog Day. It's the same function over and over. You wake up, you make hot water. So that's all these systems do. It's just the same thing over and over. Same uh, basic flow pattern, same basic runtime. You can see there's a plot of one of our projects. There's the power and the flow on the top. This is about a week or two. Um, now we're going to look at some field installation and load shapes. Sean, any guess here? Okay. Uh, well, it's a coral fungus. Um, yeah. And I uh, just eaten one recently. Is it a candy one? Can you candy this? No. No. Coral hydnum. Well, I got it. Very delicious. The, you did. You you did. Had no. So time, how do you eat it? Tell me. You just. You just cut that thing off. I found them as big as uh, like like forty pounds. I found a monster Whoa. once, and you slice it and, nice and fry it. It's great. Yeah, exactly. All right. Anyway, these are these are prized, um, and they appear early in the fall. And and this is on. this is probably not a coincidence that you've become a vegan, right? Right. Right. <laughs> cool. <Yes. laughs> okay. We'll be done. Okay, so Elizabeth James um, is the project. This is a really important project. Um, it sort of represents the field proof of the prescriptive uh, heat pump water heating system that's that's in play in in California. Uh, this is a project. This had an, a central electric um, water heating system. We've got a lot of these in Washington State because of uh, in the 80s, that's what the, all the housing authorities installed because hydro was really cheap electricity. Uh, this system is 60 units. Um, it, <clears throat> it is supportive housing, which means the tenants mostly live there. Um, I mean, they're mostly home all day. Uh, the total capacity of this system is five tons. It's four, 
um, for single pass um, sand in systems. Um, coupled to this are 550 gallons of storage and 175 gallon swing tank. Um, so for 60 units of apartments, we are seeing about a 5 kW peak draw total for water heating, uh, which is pretty low. Uh, that's equivalent to about um, a single electric resistance water heater in, a, in one single family house, and this is serving 60 units. That's amazing. Um, I, I see the yeah. impact of all those 60 individual hybrid heat pump water heaters, and it, I, in my yeah. presentation yesterday, like, it's a disaster. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really the true value of, of having central systems is you can you can bank on this diversity um, and you're you're creating this this giant battery of hot water in the 550 gallons of storage and you're just offline on this little little engine that could and it's just making hot water all day. Um, one of the shortfalls on this project, um, we don't have controls for monitoring the status. Um, and so we end up having to look at our m and v data on a weekly basis um, to make sure things are okay and so we're working on that on the next iteration with the housing authority uh, the other thing is the four heat pumps end up um, running longer than the manufacturer is recommending and so manufacturer i think has told us 16 hours a day uh, and then 20 hours and so we're seeing upwards of 20 hours in the winter months here um, and so I think a lot of that is um, they tend to defrost a lot on the colder days. And so they're, they're sort of, they take, they have to run them longer. But that's what we're seeing there. Um, you know, I would say that the, uh, the, 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 the findings on this project, again, you know, this was us uh, first time out. The swing tank's a little, a little bit small and the heat pump run time's a little bit excessive and we don't have a control system. So we're working on that um, next iteration. Um, I, I do wanna show you kind of a hot water draw comparison of two different types of multifamily buildings. One is supportive housing, meaning the tenants are living there full time. So a lot of low income um, it has, has this sort of program. And the other would be market rate. And so you can see the curves, there's a weekday kind of flow um, pattern or shape, and there's a weekend. Um, but you can see there's really, on uh, market rate, there's kind of two peaks, and then supportive, it, it's kind of, you know, throughout the day. But they both um, sort of have this morning peak. Um, and that's really this where the storage plays in, is, is, is you, have to, you have to have enough storage to kind of deal with that morning dump load. Uh, here's some more data on uh, this particular project. This is showing on the left as a as a summertime, on the right is a winter time. So I look for kind of the hotter day and the colder day. This is in Seattle. Uh, we can see on the left, um, you know, 80 degree day in the in the daytime. COP for that day, we calculate COPs on an on a daily basis, uh, coming in about 3.2. Uh, we can see the flow pattern and below we can see the uh, load shape and so this is uh, that's that four sand in system you can kind of see the load shape on a single day um, sort of aligns with our solar window um, and so this is will be a really important um, as we start to try to try to optimize around load shift um, the the curve on the right is the same system on a really cold day. We can see the temperature got down to about 22 in Seattle. Uh, COP was running about 2.4 for that day. Now we see that fluctuate 2.4 to 2.7. This day was sort of the extreme. Um, and you can see the flow and we can also see the input power. One thing to notice on the right bottom is you'll see a lot of more sporadic runtime. That is the defrost cycle occurring. So we're melt, those sandins are melting ice. And so they tend to run longer to make up uh, the, the downtime or the time that they're not running. Um, <clears throat> and then this is a bigger kind of picture of uh, kind of a seasonal um, monitoring. So this is about six months of data and you can see the, the air temperature on the top curve. We can also see kind of a daily average COP, um, you know, three, three and a half in the warmer months and, you know, two and a half to three in the cooler months. Uh, we've also got, um, you can kind of see the input power. So this short sort of shows, you know, about 5k dub peak and then we've got some little spikes in there. That would be our swing tank um, spiking. And then the 
the curve on the bottom kind of shows the water temperature in that final swing tank. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more, but you can see that we definitely are keeping it above 120 most of the hours, but we do drop down. And so this is what I had mentioned about the swing tank being a little bit undersized. Um, this is, you know, we, ha we have seen some, some uses of, of resistance, but not very much, you can see. So this is promising. Yeah, a pause there. Oh, uh, oyster mushroom. Yeah, um, no. I'll tell oh. <laughs> anyway, oh. question. Okay, question with um, some. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, your COPs. We were testing in Sunnyvale, yeah. and we were getting 4.2 to 4.5 with the Sandins. Um, okay. And except when we got to November, then all of a sudden it dropped down to about 3.5. And okay. we didn't actually get, unfortunately, we don't have our monitoring data from December and January because you know, January is just completing now, um, but at least analyzed. I see you up in a colder place. Um, those are outside their Seattle region, right? So significantly colder, yep. different latitude, all that. Um, yep. And this is great. And it's interesting because uh, R134, when it's being used in a big central heap of water heater, naming no names, um, their efficiencies, I think, are like advertised as 2.7 COP. It's sort of their peak. So, like a CO2 versus an R134, my point is just like my understanding is there's significantly greater efficiency at a CO2. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, we've got a couple projects that we've looked at, and I think our, our 134A projects installed in, in parking garages come up. Uh, on an annual of about 2.6, and our CO2 installed outside are close to about three average on the annual. So there's 2.6 to three, and I think that just goes with that cycle. The CO2 cycle is a higher efficiency cycle. That's a 10% difference. And <clears throat> then on this power demand thing, your point being if there's a swing tank, you'd have a completely flat demand almost. It looks like year round. If, if, Correct. Okay. Do you have that same yeah. understanding of how R is R134 doesn't go that cold before it goes into resistance mode? Right? Yeah, I mean some of the that's right. Like I'll talk about that later but but about 42 degrees entering air on a 134A machine, you'll start to frost up. And depending on what the strategy is, to deal with defrost and to deal with the colder air. There's, you know, different manufacturers have different strategies. Um, you know, some of the products you really should not be putting outside in uh, freezing conditions. They just, they just don't work. But 134A is definitely limited um, below, below 45. All right. Thanks. So th this is an, the argument for like, hey, let's accelerate getting rid of these old, not so useful refrigerants and move on. Thank you. Right. Yep. All right. Here's your here's your turn. Any guesses there? Okay. Does anyone else on the chat want to take a stab on this one? Because I already failed. And um, <laughs> is it? I don't. I mean, like on the top, it, it, the that like firm side looks like it could be sort of a chanterelle, but it doesn't have the the shape exactly. What's underneath? Are the gills yeah. or bars? They're like stalagmites. Stalag Ooh, hedgehog. Yes. Good job. I didn't give you all the details, but you're right. Hedgehog. Good job. <laughs> okay. Nice. I was a vegan for years. All right. Old. It's delicious. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so the next uh, item that we'll discuss will be the prescriptive central heat pump water heating design. Um, so this was what Danny had showed yesterday. Um, I'll, I'll reiterate some of this. Um, but this is this is sort of the first out of the gate approved um, central system. Um, I've been kind of treating this as you know this this can serve about 60 units, um, and that will deliver that will require between um, you know six to nine sandins. Um, but I think that's kind of the sweet spot, and then obviously anything underneath. Um, again, I had talked about the project we're doing uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, we're going to put in four 60-unit plants to to meet a 250-unit apartment. Um, so I think that's a a pretty nice solution. Um, you know, there's there's things to kind of say about this, but this is um, how that Elizabeth James 
uh, project is piped. Um, there's some more guidance in that um, directive that got released on some of the specs and also sizing requirements. Um, I will say that um, the things to watch out for when you're installing this, um, you know, the, the sand ins, you direct pipe water to them. So make sure you've got a strategy for both a power outage as well as freeze protect because th that's potable water. So we can't put any sort of glycol or anything in there. Uh, typically a heat trace. And then there's another strategy where you can, you can install a fail, a fail open. So when power goes out, the, the, the loop outside will close a valve and then drain it out. Uh, so you could actually drain it down in a colder climate. Um, <clears throat> you know, the other challenge with this that uh, we're currently working with Sandin on this particular design that I'm um, working on is how to get the multiple um, thermistor, um, thermistors into a single um, aqua, aqua well in inside of the how our storage tank and um there is a, a fix for this and so that's being developed right now with the manufacturer um, the other key piece here to note is that um, i really like doing tanks in even number or sorry in odd numbers so that you have a center tank and that represents kind of your 50 percent water draw um, this is analogous to how sandin sets up their single tank to you know for for single family where the center is sort of right in the middle uh, but that's that's my preference that's what's shown here there's obviously no no um, constraint on this but something to consider i like doing um the one in the middle you know having an odd number of tanks and then obviously everything feeds into the swing tank and getting the size of that storage as well as the the actual element is is kind of crucial uh, thermostatic mixing valves should be auto, um, electronic the static ones won't really work well with the swing tank so you're going to have to use an electronic one um, and then on the hot water circ pumps um, you know ecm motors now are are kind of um, pretty prevalent in the industry and having the ability to adjust that circ pump flow I think is really critical too so we like to use ECMs on those um, but that's that's about it on that so I'll move move on um, all right Sean you know uh, this one well it's a Bowley um, yeah and it, not a slippery jack or it's maybe like a king Bowley it, correct ding 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 all right. King Willie. Yes. Yes. I found this um, about um, a quarter mile from my house. Um, so it's a great, a great front yard of, of one of my neighbors. You live in a good spot. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> They're everywhere. All right. Moving on. Um, okay. So now I'm going to dive into the primary hot water plant sizing um, and kind of go through this. Um, bear with me, there's going to be some math and, and, and equations here, but I just want to kind of show you the focus uh, on how we are sizing our systems. Um, and this is mostly in Seattle, we, we can do central systems or decentralized. Um, so we're not constrained by our, our um, compliance modeling. Um, <clears throat> And so what we have found, um, we've actually mostly been using the low guideline. So a little kind of high level on what this, what this um, sizing methodology is. Um, I'll kind of, I'll use the two of these, but essentially we're using the low guideline. And the way to think about this is you've got these peak minutes. And so I showed, I showed the curve that showed that morning warm up peak. Uh, draw and if you look at the width of that that's about three hours so that's about where we end up um, sizing to and so what it says is in the low at 180 minutes which is three hours um, you're gonna you're gonna require 6.1 gallons per person so that 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 set your storage size so if you got a hundred people in an apartment times six that's 600 gallon storage um, and so that's sort of where that happens. And the way that this sizing works is, is you set your storage to handle that peak. And then all you have to do is make sure that your plant is sized. Your, so your hot water, your heat pump plant, you got to make sure that that can deliver um, along the slope of, this, of these three curves. 
So as long as you size that, that capacity on your heat pump to the slope of that curve, and I'll show you an example so you can understand what I mean by slope, um, you will be fine. And we have put this to test on every design and we've never ran out of water. Uh, so this, this does work. Um, you don't, there's no need to use medium or high in multifamily. Our low flow fixtures, you know, are, are 20 to 22 gallons of hot per person per day is covered by low. Um, we've actually got field data and we've created what I would call a low, low medium. So it's a little bit higher than low that we will, we will use on some projects, but we've also vetted it against the low and it, it would, you know, the sizing comes out okay. So when you start um, start into sizing your hot water plants, um, there's sort of uh, four basic inputs. Um, number of apartments, number of bedrooms, um, select the total number of people. So all of the sizing really gets, gets down into the number of people you're serving. Um, entering water temps and discharge water. Entering, we use 50, discharge is 120. So I'll, I'll show a, an example of this on a big project that I actually did the calcs for, so it was easy to, for me to, to pull from. Um, is a market rate, 321 unit apartment, 406 people. Um, so first step, um, that curve I talked to you about is over to the right. If you look at that peak event, it goes from about, um, Eh, seven to to ten, you know, maybe eight to nine, eight to eleven, but somewhere along there. And so that's kind of our sizing interval. And so everything in that sort of window to the right between our eight and eight and eleven, um, that we want to gather gather in storage. So this would be step one is sizing the storage. So we look at our 180 minute um, width of of peak. And we say it's 6.1 um, gallons per person. So higher mass, um, you know, 6.1 times 417. It's actually 417 people. I had it wrong on the last slide. It ends up at 2,544 gallons of hot water. So that sets our storage in these systems. So in that 180 minute peak event, 2,500, you know, a little bit more than 2,500 gallons are drawn. Um, tanks are not 100% efficient in storage, and so you wanna add another 20%. So we usually assume single pass are on 80%. So 2,500, 44 divided by 0.8, sizing 3,180 gallons. So that sets our sizing for a 321 unit apartment. Next step would be to find the localized GPM. Uh, and this is really that question or that task of, of, of you taking care of the dump load, that big initial draw, and then what's left is, is figuring out what your recovery rate is so you've got, um, so you can recover all of that heat. Remember, we don't need the, the real-time function of this, of this heat pump. We just need it to be offline and making sure there's enough time and capacity to, to, to build up that reserve of storage. Um, so what you have to do is you have to actually interpolate between these two values to figure out the slope. Um, and so I've got that same example, 321 units, 417 people. Uh, the 180 minute storage is 6.1 and then times 417 gives you the 25. And then we go to the next line, which is the 1440 minutes. That's IE 24 hours um, day. So that's the full day. Um, and we say there's 20 gallons being used in that full day. Um, times 417, there's 8340. So you can find the slope across these two points. You've got your two gallon numbers, you divide by your time numbers, that equals your GPM, higher math, you get 4.6 GPM. So 4.6 GPM, that's the localized slope or continuous draw rate to meet all the hot water load in 24 hours. And that's the critical piece. And so what you have to do is size your plant to be able to raise 4.6 GPM up 70 degrees. Uh, which brings us to the next step, um, the primary hot water plant. So this is sizing the primary heat pump plant. And so um, we use um, sort of the, the um, a standard calculation in um, engineering, which is uh, the mass flow equation, Q dot equals M dot C sub P delta T, um, 4.6 GPM 
um, times 60 times 8.3 B, uh, BTUs per degree per gallon times um, CP of one. 120 minus 50 is 70. Anyway, I don't expect you to follow this, but higher math gets you to 160,000 BTU per hour or about 13.4 tons. Um, now you have to then check this against your heat pump work that has to be done, right? You only have 24, you have to decide how long you want this um, heat pump to run. And this is this starts to get into this question about load shift is, is you know, you don't, you can't do load shift if you need the heat pump to run 24 hours a day. It just, you, you need you need to be able to meet all of the day's load in a shorter amount of time. Um, so if we look at the work required to, to um, <clears throat> for the heat pump, we've got uh, 9,000 gallons and some change um, of 120 degree water. And so the amount of work to, to, to make all that ends up being about 5 million BTUs per day. So 5330094 BTUs per day. So now you look at your, you take that, that's your total number of BTUs per day for this size of apartment, 321 units. And now you, you, you run that against your runtime. And we typically like to target between 12 and 16 hours a day. So I've shown a runtime of 24 hours, 16 and 12, and then, you're dividing your BTUs by your by your runtime. The BTUs are your work, your five million BTUs. That's the work you have to extend. Uh, and so you can see the range of sizing. So if you were to run this heat pump 24 seven and never let it stop, which you don't wanna do, you have to give it a rest. Um, it's 18.5 tons. The other reason you don't wanna do that is because when defrost happens, you actually um, stop the heat pump to melt the ice. And so you lose that that operating time. Um, 16 hours is a is a pretty good target. Um, 12 hours um, will cover in some product will cover the defrost time, and so you'll end up being more like 16 in the colder months. Um, and so you can see the range of sizing: 18 and a half tons, 27 and 37 tons for this 321 unit apartment. Um, over to the right, um, the other critical piece here is that. <clears throat> Now you've got your load. Now you need to make a selection, and so I've got two uh, manufacturers' um, uh, D-rate capacity, and so the one on the top is the sand, and and you can see at the different outside air temperatures uh, what the output capacity is. This product um, does not really drop off until you get into the single digits, and so there's uh, this is a this is a pretty key feature of CO2. It, it's because of that it's not, it's not a condensing cycle. It's just a really hot gas um, heat exchanger. Um, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't really, it's not really impacted until it starts to get really cold out. Uh, this makes CO2 a really favorable refrigerant cycle, the transcritical cycle. Uh, the, the curves on the bottom are a 134A um, curve, and you can see that there's pretty significant D rate. And so, you know, in the summer months, 80 degree wet bulb, you're at 310 or, you know, maybe 290, and that goes all the way down to 170. So, on 134A stuff, when we put it in the parking garage, we just assume a 50% D rate. So, you've got to buy a lot more equipment when you're using a 134A cycle. So, something to keep in mind um, the sizing is one thing, but it's the actual. Um, capacity you get at design, which is important. Um, so here's a summary of the primary hot water plant sizing. So we went through this, we came up with, you know, 37 tons of heat pump and 3180 gallons of storage. Uh, so that, that sets your, your sizing, but it's not the, it's not the full story. Um, the other things you have to consider, and I, did, I didn't have time to go through all of this, so I'll just kind of talk about it. Um, our redundancy, and so you know, sometimes no, you, heat pumps. You still have thirty yeah. minutes, just so you know. Okay, and and uh, I've got a lot of slides. Oh, oh, yeah. pardon me. Uh, well, there's a question here of like, hey, if there's only five yeah. kilowatts of peak power draw, does it make economic sense to bother with the load shift that requires more storage and more outdoor units? Like, is the value there for doing this load shifting? Th that's a great question. Um, I haven't done that, but it uh, it is a great question and insight you know what is what is 5k dub on a 60 unit apartment is it worth it no that's a great question um i think 
the answer really lies in what what the value of this is to the utility because i you know the tenant side you're not really going to see much but it's a bigger value to the utility which has these peaking issues um Gotcha. But yeah, 5K dub is is that a is that a deal breaker? Is that really? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. One. Well, it's just That's I mean, a great question. Yeah, thank you very much for for taking a stab at it. Yeah. Um, all right. So in in terms of kind of your hot water plant sizing, there's there's um, other things to consider are redundancy, and so don't set up a plant with just one heat pump. Um, at a minimum always do two and so these would be central plants of any size but at a minimum at least do two so if one goes out um, then at least you're you're covered um, reliability um, is, is really important uh, you can't run out of hot water and on our, on our 134a designs we tend to always have full capacity uh, design output and electric resistance on our co2 you know sand in product we tend to um, just have multiple um, sand ins. They're pretty small, and so you kind of cover it there. Um, but you do have to. The, the thing yeah. about that, you just think you pointed out you have electric resistance as an issue for not having enough thermal storage, which isn't quite the same thing as your load shifting argument, but it might have a very similar impact, which is to say that yes. you, know, you, you need to have so much storage that you never have to use that electric resistance because that, you know, you might only usually have five kilowatts of consumption. But when it becomes 20 or 50 or like, you know, when you go from a CO, when you, when you kick in that electric resistance, it's four or five times as much energy use, right? Before, probably four times yeah. as much energy use. Okay, so that's, yeah, that ties back in. Yeah, it does. It definitely does. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a big question is, is how to kind of size that. Because at the end of the day, you can't run out of hot water. And if you have a heat pump that's dead in the water, um you know you you're kind of at the mercy of well you know you need to get some you need you need hot water here so we need to you know do whatever we can now, to get and, that um, now, i appreciate the seriousness you're taking this with but i've gone to so many hotels and lived in dormitories and had all sorts of multifamily living experiences in which we did run out of hot water and these have been nice places and these have been crummy places, but it's been a consistent experience that you might not have hot yeah. water. You might have tepid water in the morning for your shower. So just, that's the reality of the world. What's your thought? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think, you know, that's a bigger, bigger kind of question. Like we're going to, we're heading into, um, you know, this era where time, the time that we use energy and just the use of energy um, you know, we've been living in this world where we have free reign, we can use energy whenever we want. But I think that that kind of gets back to this bigger point about, you know, are we going to make sacrifices as a society and as, you know, building users and hot water consumers, you know, is there, is there some sacrifice that has to be made at the consumer side? And, you know, I would say that, you know, it, it depends. Well, <laughs> you know, the designer percentile. Like it, in the yeah. CO2 retrofits have had in California, many of them have kept in gas boilers under the argument that they had yeah. to meet the 99th percentile event. And to, and to meet that last percentile, it doubled the size of the system. And I wondered, right. like, maybe 1% of the time people are getting tepid water is okay because that's just the shakes, you know, life happens. It happens to me in my yeah. family house. It, it's not a, a crime right. or anything. It just happens sometimes. That's right. 65 yeah. gallons, but it happens. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great question. It's um, being in the, the role that we are kind of building, you know, efficient hot water plants for market rate stuff. Um, boy, we get an earful if, if the hot water ever goes down. And so you, you want to try to avoid that. But no, I think you're, you know, you're right. This is an important issue or topic because it's like, you know, as we as we have to kind of change our ways, we definitely should not you know it shouldn't always be that you you never want to run out of hot water at the expense of you know the grid and other things so yeah, yeah. a good a good talking point okay um oh peter wants to let you know that the arctic 410 machines work well at temperatures at 10 degrees um i sent that over to you sean uh, so you're yeah yeah 
part. I, I'm interrupting. Yeah. But that's just a cool thing. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I, I had, I don't, haven't um, used that product, but I'm intrigued. Um, I have seen it before and I've, I'm actually thinking about it on a project in Seattle, but yeah, that's great to hear. I'd love to get more, more data or insight onto that product. And last one, uh, drain line heat recovery. Yep. Have you, um, do you find a case for using drain line heat recovery to extend capacity, reliability, and energy savings in this same argument of, of that efficiency move can increase capacity and such? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, you know, I think in terms of the technology and, and what you'd get, you know, sure, taking, taking 20, 30 percent of the load on heat recovery, I mean, conservation is always king. And so I would say, yeah, that's great, um, you know, provided it doesn't impact. I mean, most of the drain water heat recovery stuff we've looked at wouldn't really impact um, the sand in or the or the 134A stuff. So I think it then just becomes a question of cost, you know, how much where do you want to put the dollars? You're chasing kilowatt hours and where do you want to put the dollars? So it's kind of a cost effectiveness question. All right, thanks. Okay, um, let's see. So we left off the so backup electric water heater we tend to use, um, but you know, thinking about that in the context of reliability, redundancy is, is important. Um, a lot of times, um, we can we will review these these two strategies with the owners, and sometimes we'll get good feedback on what they want, and so that's something to consider versus you know designers making all of the assumptions. Um, you know, defrost is real with heat pumps. Um, Sandins will defrost. Uh, 134As, all the heat pumps will will defrost. Um, you know, Southern California climates. Probably won't see a lot, but I don't have a lot of experience in that climate zone, so I can't speak on that. But we certainly see it up here, up north in Seattle. Um, so you have to sort of plan around that. Different manufacturers have different strategies for dealing with defrost um, and entering air and what it does to the coils and the cycle. Uh, freeze protect is also a really important piece. Anytime you've got um, potable water outside or any water outside that doesn't have proper freeze protect, um, it can be a real problem. So you have to kind of make sure you're covered there. Um, the D rate of the heat pump is really important. Um, you know, that like I said, the 134A stuff gets is almost a 50% hit, whereas the CO2 stuff is uh, in our climate, design temp is around 20 degree. Um, we don't see any capacity hit on that. So that is the CO2, the benefit. Uh, the storage temps are pretty important. Uh, we tend to store between 140 and 170. Some of the newer CO2 products can make upwards of 190. Uh, you do take an efficiency hit the hotter the water temp, so there's an optimization there on on how to how to kind of set that up. Um, I don't know of any products that can actually be automated to change the storage temps as you know one potential load shift. Um, it's usually a manual setup you go in. I don't know of any any product that can do that, but I don't know all the products, so it may it may exist. Uh, load shift again, this is really important. Um, you know, figuring out, um, you know, as the question was posed, you know, if we've got a 60 unit and there's 5 kW of peak, do we even bother? Um, maybe the answer is no. Maybe it's yes. I I, don't, I can't really answer that, but. But keeping in mind that this is kind of the eventual end goal. This is the real value of having heat pump water heating. Um, a, it's the electri electrification and no no greenhouse gas emissions. But it's but it's more about being able to control that load so we stay out of the the AC peak peak range in you know, the evening four to nine. Uh, so this is this is really important and. Um, <clears throat> You know, we're actually working on developing sizing and, and load shift um, um, simulation tools right now. And so we'll have some, we've got some pretty good insight into this now. So excited to kind of get that out. Um, then the other really important part about the hot water plant sizing are the controls and the alarming. Um, you know, this stuff is still kind of, um, I mean, it, it's it's working. We've got good systems working. We've got contractors trained, but you know, as this stuff, you know, in, it, in its sort of infancy, it's highly recommended that you have um, insight into what's happening in, in your plants and also any sort of major 
equipment alarming. And we usually um, always connect our control systems to the internet and so that we can, we can remotely um, see what's going on. Uh, let's see, so we'll get back to the prescriptive heat pump water heating um, design. This is the California prescriptive uh, system. And so um, this, this particular program that's out has kind of a sizing uh, methodology in there. Um, and you know, there's a lot of things that went into this because this sizing methodology actually came out of the CBEC res um, simulation, the pilot that's that's um, still being kind of um, uh, developed and will soon be released, um, as Danny mentioned. Um, and so this sizing, I took that same um, example and kind of ran it through. And so you end up with with a, a little more capacity and a little more storage, but they're you know they're 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 close, but but this um, sizing really covers. It was designed to kind of cover the full um, climate zone, so the whole range in the state. Um, and beyond that, I I wasn't directly involved in this. I I don't know a lot about that, but this kind of shows you that there's there's a range. Uh, this is a prescriptive. Uh, you won't get in trouble with this approach. Um, can I just uh, say, moving on. So, oh, the sizing yeah. comparison, did you have that up here? What was the difference between one sizing strategy and the other? Uh, the, the, so there's, there's, the yeah, so here's the, good. Yeah, okay. that's a great question. Um, so 37 and 37 tons and 3180 for a 321 unit apartment. And this one is 58 and 3600. Um, and so, this is a this is a rather large um, apartment building, pretty rare. I don't think you'd see this variation in a smaller, more typical size, you know, hundred unit. But I haven't, I I don't have that much experience with it. This is pretty pretty fresh. So, but I thought I'd run it for this so you could kind of see what's what's happening. Okay. So just one more time, can you go back? It's fifty eight tons and thirty six hundred gallons here. Can you go back up to see what your sizing was? Thirty seven tons and thirty one eighty. So it's mostly a larger compressor size quantity. Like there's yeah maybe like a 20% increase, 15% increase in storage, but 37 to 58, um, that's not a, a doubling, but that's like 60% more or something. Um, just quick mental mathing here. So anyway, yeah. it, it is, it seems like the expensive part is the heat pump. And yeah. that's the part that's being, pretty dramatically increased uh, in yeah. the California sizing. So what's your thought on that? This is, uh, um, yeah. I, I think that, you know, the stuff that I had shown back here, um, you know, for, for one, like 37, you can't buy, there's no multiples to get you to 37, right? You're gonna buy like three, you know, four, Oh, higher math, right? Like three twelve tons or something, or probably three fifteen ton systems. So you'd be at, you know, closer to forty, forty five. Um, but we also, I mean, this is kind of your basic amount of of of, you know, on this on this primary hot water. That's your that's kind of your absolute minimum. But when you're actually taking this and 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 putting product to it and then thinking about your reliability, your redundancy strategy, I think um you know, that's what's being sort of assumed in this prescriptive size. And there's a lot more of that. I also think that the climate zones that are, um, you know, this is covering everything. And I know that this was pushed through the simulation. And so um, they were also looking at the potential of electric backup on this. Um, but I, I don't, I, yeah, I guess I don't have a lot really to say about the, the, this difference other than, you know, it is there, but I don't, um, I don't have enough, um, I guess, time with this particular one to make much comment on but, it. But very useful, though, for Lisa, for us to identify that there's a difference and there might be good rationales for the differences, but thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, great. Uh, so I wanted to just kind of show, here's the California prescriptive. Um, you know, kind of how the in schematic, uh, very similar to what we showed before. I'll, re I'll reference this schematic again. Um, I wanted to just maybe have a quick discussion 
about load shift. And so um, if we look at uh, a typical draw pattern for that Elizabeth James pro um, project, and we look at, you know, one day we can see the input power below, we see the flow above. And if we're talking about kind of having this load shift capability, so right now there's a lot of focus on 4 to 9 p.m., um, you know, here are the impacts. So one of the mo one of the critical pieces are that the the hot water draw draw profile is actually pretty important. So you get a different answer with a different draw profile. So you've really got to have a sizing um, methodology when you're thinking about load shift that takes this into account. Um, you are likely going to have to add some heat pump capacity as we discussed. You're also going to have to you may have to add some storage capacity. You can also play with the temperature. One of the critical pieces is, is that you, you must have, you got to have full control of the heat pump operation. So you need to be able to control both the on function and the off, fun, off function of the heat pumps. Um, the Sandin products alone um, are designed to be, to work with a tank. Um, and so you have to kind of add some controls to kind of, uh, you know, some middle ground controls that you can add some logic in to do that. Um, so kind of the takeaway here is there's a, you know, sizing tool being developed. Uh, it will include the load shapes and the load shift calculations. Um, and so, but just keep in mind that this is a, a, the eventual goal of hot water heating at a central level. And so things to consider. And I think the sizing that we saw earlier um, you know, this would this would certainly suggest that you've got um, some room to do um, some load shift. But you know, this is this is um, sort of the first round out there, and so we'll see. Maybe there'll be refinements. Um, so to summarize some of the findings on the actual heat pump water heaters, so part of the selections, kind of showing the two. You know, the CO2. I'll just run through the CO2 is a transcritical cycle. Um, this is quite favorable for um, high lift um, and also um, can handle a wide range of outside air temperatures. The Sandins um, work by, they have a thermistor, they look at the middle, 50, you know, the 50% height of your tank or the middle of your tank. Uh, they'll trigger on when you drop below 113 in that thermistor and they will turn off when the incoming water to the Sandin reaches 122. So that's how those work. Now. Um, you can you can actually um, put controls in to kind of work, you know, and 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 come up with some tricks to 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 work with this product. But this is essentially taking a single family uh, heat pump water heater and making it useful for multifamily. Um, you know, we like to target the incoming water temps to the sand and to stay below 100 for optimal performance. Um, Again, the trigger is 122 is when they turn off. But if you're designing so that they that they rarely the 122 ha usually happens right at the end of the cycle. Um, but you want to you want to try to keep that incoming as low as possible. Um, you know we are working on with Sandin now on that project I talked about in the Bay Area to develop a control system to be able to control each of the heat pumps individually. Um, um, just reiterating that the Sandins and other CO2 heat pump watering products, they do require good um, water quality. Because the hot gas cooler is so hot, um, any impurities in the water will scale immediately on those heat exchangers. And so they're really precious. Um, they're, you know, these heat exchangers and everything about the CO2 cycle, they're, you know, it's a really high pressure uh, system. And so it's all specialized um, piping, stainless steel, kind of high pressure. But you do want to take care of those um, of that water quality. The Sandins, in particular, have a really fine um, filter on them, a strainer, and it tends to clog up quickly. But they do that to say to sort of preserve um, the heat exchanger from the scale buildup. Uh, so you do have to watch out for water quality. Um, the other nice thing about stand-ins are that they don't lose capacity to a single digit. So they're, they, they can be thought of as more cost effective, not having to buy additional D-rate capacity. Um, over on the, on the kind of the 134A side, uh, this is a subcritical refrigeration cycle. So this relies on the actual refrigerant to, to change phase. And then that release of, of energy in that phase change is sort of the magic or where, how you're moving the heat. Um, you know, 134A will defrost at around 42. Uh, there's there's different strategies. There's hot gas defrost. There's also 
um, installing uh, an electric resistance coil in front of the evaporator coil to essentially warm the air. So those are kind of the two strategies in freezing climates uh, that I'd recommend. Uh, and both both the 134A manufacturers offer that, Nile and Colmac. Uh, target incoming water, um, you know, should be less than about 110. Um, the real key piece here is that um, you really have to think about, you've got a heat pump, it's got X capacity, you have to figure out where those BTUs go. If you don't have a place for those BTUs, you will, you will high limit out, high pressure alarm. And that's the big difference between gas boilers and heat pumps is you have to, you have to make sure you've got a place to put those BTUs once you start firing that cycle. Um, most of the 134A products are fully uh, controls capable DDC connections, so they're pr they're pretty powerful, kind of commercial grade stuff. Um, the 134A cycles are um, they're much cooler heat exchange cycles, so the scale isn't as big as a pro of a concern. Um, then the, just highlighting the 134A cycles, they lose about 50% capacity um, at design, which is or not, not designed, but at 42 entering. So careful selection is required for that for that equipment type. All right, next next identification. Sean, any guesses? All right. Okay, I. I mean, it's another Boley, but yeah, not fair because I already like I went through the ones I know very well. Is it a slippery jack? Okay. Uh, no, this one is a birch bolete. Um, oh. These grow under birch birch trees. They're really tasty. So if you find one of those, pick it, eat it. It's good. No, there's no birch trees down here, punk. That wasn't a <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, no, it's a beautiful mushroom. Like you. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It was huge. It was like eight, you know, ten inches high. It's a monster. Anyway, Woo. it was delicious. Here we go. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about temperature maintenance sizing. Um, so temperature maintenance. This is maintaining the loop. Um, there's really three strategies that I can think of, or two right now. Um, there's an educated guess. Uh, this is mostly what we do, and we use a conservative value somewhere between 80 and 120 watts in apartment, and we assume that and size. Um, we have gotten into trouble on a job doing this, so you do have to be careful. Now I will look at a design and say, hey, that looks like this other project, so it's going to be a right around here. Um, not a great strategy or technique, but that's what we have. Um, the other approach would be to actually go through and do a detailed accounting of all of your hot water supply and circulation piping and come up with a, a UA and then calculate um, a, a heat loss rate. Uh, the ASPE recirc losses calculator could be used and then you kind of flip, flip it around and solve for the heat, the heat rate. Um, we've done this kind of after the fact just to check what we got versus, um, you know, or what we measured versus uh, what was designed and they actually came in pretty close and so um, it actually turns out you can do this and I think it's a strategy to, to consider it, it, it does take some time um, and then another um, approach that I think is really kind of the best of both worlds um, is really to, to go do a large-scale um, field data collection look at a bunch of buildings and then come up with some um, kind of sizing protocols that are better than um, the educated guests, but don't require as much time and effort as the um, the ASPE kind of going through all the loop lengths and and doing a detailed accounting. Uh, so this is this is research that really um, needs to happen. It needs to fill in um, um, our our sizing tools. Um, here's a, an example of about four or five buildings that we've worked on um, and what the temperature maintenance losses are. And so uh, remember the temperature maintenance losses are really just the piping surface area. Uh, that's really the majority of the losses. And so we're talking about the pipe parts of the loop that are 
constantly moving, not the runouts into the units, but the parts that have moving water in a central circulation loop. And those, uh, here's the range of values we've seen. And so, you know, the 80 to 120 is sort of a, a good stab to start. Um, now, a question about what type of temp temperature maintenance heating system should we select? And the way I think about this is if your temperature maintenance load is less than 4,500 watts, you should use a swing tank. If you're over 4,500 watts, you should use a dedicated multi-pass heat pump. Uh, the reason for this um, is mostly that this also, you know, a swing tank also requires storage and it starts to get prohibitively large when the loads are bigger than 4,500. Uh, so here's um, here's the two kind of summarized. So again, the sizing less than four and a half. Um, when when you size the swing tank properly, and this is what you mentioned, Sean, that the you know the swing tank concept really allows for a full load shift of the temperature maintenance load because you don't actually need it. And so during an evening peak four to nine, you don't need any input energy to maintain the loop. You just use the swing tank. And I'll talk about the swing tank concept. Um, what this allow what this requires is you have to have at least 160 degree water in your primary storage to make the swing tank work. Uh, it works well with the distributed central loop. So this would be like uh, 60 unit sand and plants, decentralized plants scattered throughout a building. Um, when you do a dedicated heat pump system, this would be usually for larger loops when your temperature maintenance loads are greater than four and a half K dub. Um, you'd, you'd require a dedicated heat source on a large storage tank. Um, and we typically use a multi pass heat pump. Um, these would be, I think, more challenging to nearly impossible to load shift because you're always, you know, typically on the stuff that we've been doing, you run for 20 minutes, satisfy the tank, it drifts down below set point, you know, it takes 20 minutes. So it's 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off is typically what we've been targeting. Um, what we've found because on larger buildings, the research flows tend to be so large that the final tanks end up just being mixed. So you lose a lot of that stratification in that final tank. It's just one large mixed tank. Um, but again, you use these with larger central loops. Um, so kind of going through the two systems, looking over to the left on the temperature maintenance side, uh, what's shown here is um, this is the prescriptive California heat pump water heating approach with the gang sandens. This is showing the swing tank concept. So the research goes into the bottom of the tank. You've, you've got intermittent flows on the other, the opposite uh, bottom side of the tank. And then you've got an element in there to, 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 um, <clears throat> to, to back it up in case you run out of, of water. Um, here's some numbers to kind of show you in concept how the swing tank works for those that don't understand it. Your primary storage at the Elizabeth James, we've got it set to 170. And what ends up happening is you're, you're constantly flowing the 170 into this swing tank, um, you know, through, through the uses in the, in the day. And that tends to kind of prime and heat that tank. And then the hot water circs always on, it's 110 degrees and it ends up mixing with that 170. And so you never need to touch the hot water circ load with your heat pump. And so this is a way to, to kind of preserve the capacity. Uh, this is a nice system. Uh, we've done, we're designing several more of these now currently um, with some refinement. So um, a lot of promise here, but this is a great, but we tend to see these um, tanks swing between 165 and 125. So that's what we call them the swing tank. They swing. Again, you do need a, a digital mixing valve, which I haven't shown because uh, the static ones don't work well when you vary the, the hot side. Uh, so that's really important. Um, here's a swing tank kind of showing how it works. So this is um, one single day. You can see the flow in the building, the primary 170 degree water in that primary tank um, kind of pulsing into that swing tank. And then you can see the profile of the swing tank temperature and so we can see right in the you know right in the morning we tend to get pretty close to our set point um or, or 120 degree which is kind of our supply temp but you can see that we're able to mostly hold off the resistance and still keep that water in the swing tank um, at usable temp which is would be above 120. Um, again looking at the um, 
that six month draw, I just wanted to show you that here's the input power on that project. It has, um, you know, a couple spikes are shown there, but again, not very much use. Mostly the use happens around when tenants aren't there over the holidays, we tend to see it because you don't have the draws. Um, and then looking at our large single pass approach um, where we've got a dedicated heat pump. So over to the left, uh, you've got a dedicated heat pump. So on a larger circ load, you want a dedicated heat pump to just cycle and maintain that tank. Those That temperature maintenance tank um, is no longer functioning. I mean, it, it sort of functions as a swing tank during the peak, but because the research flows are much higher, it's bigger systems, you end up um, just running that heat pump all the time, you know, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, 20 minutes on and just cycling all day like a gas furnace in a house would do or heat pump, et cetera. Um, the other thing to note is we typically on our large single pass 134A systems, we'll put in backup electric on the primary plant, which we had talked. So that's what's shown over to the right. But again, this is the, uh, this would be the larger, more centralized heat pump water heating systems with the dedicated um, uh, heat pumps for, for temperature maintenance. Uh, here, here is that, this is a 195 unit apartment. Here is that swing tank operation. And this, in this building, it's about, um, it looks like 11, 12 K-dub, 11 K-dub. And you can see it cycling on and cycling off. This is just one day. And you can see we run, you know, this is the, the pattern it runs. It runs for 20 minutes off, runs and then off. So you can kind of see this, the trend there. All right, Sean, any guesses here? You know this one. Uh, Yellowfoot Chanterelle. Yes, good. Wow, you're, you're, you're scoring here. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, Winter well, we Chanterelle, also, Yellowfoot. <laughs> I appreciate that, and I <laughs> want to know what I win. But we, um, we're at almost the end, so you should skip through. If you okay. Start. I know that Tom will be able to accommodate. Will do. I'll cut short my intro. I, yeah. All right, good. Um, so here's some examples of some layouts. This is a 350 unit. Um, in this case, we're in a parking garage. We uh, down the lower left, you can kind of see the heat pumps below, and then uh, the tanks above. So you can use multiple floors. Um, we've got the heat pumps in a room. We put a grill, a louver on the room, and duct the exhaust out of the room. So this would be in a basement. Um, this is another CO2 example, kind of two loops in parallel. Um, feeding a single um, swing temperature maintenance swing tank. Um, this is a 188 unit project. Um, and that's the end. And you know those, so I won't ask. Woo! Nice uh, chanterelles. Um, yes. I, I did eat gumfist a number of times thinking, you know, it's close enough to chanterelle. I'm not getting a sick stomach. Yeah. I don't know what people are complaining about. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate you getting the inside joke. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That was so good. Woo! <clears throat> that was really fantastic, Sean. Thank you. Um, there are a few questions Great. over on the side in the chat. If you could take a couple moments to answer them, that'd be super kind of you. Uh, okay. I hope everyone enjoyed that. It was, you know, tons of great insights. Thank you so much for training us. And yes. with that, um, if you could stop sharing your screen and mute yourself, um, you can help. then